Tonight we're going to talk about the church and more specifically why we ought to love and appreciate the church of our Lord. And when I say church, I realize I'm speaking to a fairly mature Christian audience that for the most part understands the word church. But we'll mention it anyway, that no, the church is not a building. In fact, we can see clearly the church is a people, the people of God. If you were to look up the definition itself, that is ecclesia, and you look in a Greek lexicon, you get the idea of a group or assembly or assemblage. It has to do with people. Now, in the New Testament text, most of the time the word ecclesia is translated church but not every time in the King James Version. For instance, in Acts 19, you have it translated assembly on three times. Other translations in Acts 7 would translate other than church on one occasion. Most of the times it's translated church. But to illustrate the idea of it is a people... In Acts 8, 1, you read about a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And then if you were to say, well, tell me more about this. Well, you find that persecution in a continuing fashion as you get to chapter 9, verse 1, and it says, But Saul, breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. You know, you could say, wait, wait. Okay, the persecution in Acts 8, 1 was against the church. The persecution in Acts 9, 1 is against the disciples of the Lord. And so, yes, we can make that obvious conclusion. The church is the disciples of the Lord, the people that belong to Jesus. Now, sometimes I've heard people say, well, the church is the people. Don't say we go to church. Well, in the sense that the word can be translated assembly, if you're going to the assembly, well, you could say, go to church. But as far as this building, it's the meeting place. We might say church building, that is the building where we assemble. But no, the church is not the building. Turn over now to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. And we're going to have two or three occasions. I'm going to ask you to just turn because we're going to read a passage a little bit at length. But in Ephesians 5, you have a section that reads, Wives and Husbands. But the interesting thing here is, yes, it's about wives and husbands, but it's also about Christ and the church. And each illustrate the other. And we learn about each from the other. Let's start in chapter, chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 22, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and Hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. 
However, let every one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You know, as you walk away from this, it's easy to see. Yes, he does talk about marriage, the husband and wife, and then Christ and the church and illustrates each by the other. For the wife, the primary thing he says is you submit, wives. But then in making the comparison of Christ and the church, it's obvious. The church gives total submission to Jesus. Then he speaks of the husband. And the primary thing he's saying to husbands, husbands, you love your wives. But then you see the way he illustrates it with Jesus and his love for the church. He gave himself up. For the church. That is, he gave his life. He sacrificed himself. This is the kind of love husband is to have for the wife. And oh, by the way, if the husband has this kind of love for his wife, you can be sure of this. It's easier for her to be that submissive wife. And if she is a submissive wife, it's to that degree easier for him to love his wife. It's one of those things that's reciprocal in nature. And if each does his part, it gets better and better. But if there's a breakdown on one side, oftentimes there's a breakdown on both sides. And it gets worse and worse. But here we see Christ and the church. The first reason that the church should be so important to us and that we should love the church is because of what Christ said about the church. Turn over in your Bibles to Matthew 16, 18. I mentioned that I'm going to turn to about three places in the process. And I hope you will because we're going to be reading several verses. Matthew chapter 16. We'll start here reading in verse 13. Matthew 16 beginning in verse 13. And what we're looking for is what Christ said about the church. Verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now listen, verse 16. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice three things here about the church. First of all, notice that it's personal with Jesus. He said, I will build my church. It's personal with Jesus. Now, personal with Jesus? I read a debate several years back, and in the debate, one person Amongst many of his arguments, one of his arguments was, well, the church was established during the days of John the Baptist. Well, the gospel preacher, he let it be known, no, it's not in the days of John the Baptist, but it was in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Well, you know, I think that to shut down this idea of it was established during the days of John the Baptist and with John the Baptist is just to look at this verse. It's not about John the Baptist. It's about Jesus. And he's saying, I will build my church. It's personal with Jesus. When we see that connection with Jesus and the church, how can the church not be important to us and how could we not love the church second notice what Jesus said was purposeful he said I will build 
I will build. First of all, it's in the future tense. So at this particular point in time, he had not yet built his church yet in the future. And oh, by the way, it's kind of interesting. If you want to see the word church, sometimes just read it. From Matthew to Revelation, you're going to see future, 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 future. And then suddenly, here it is in the presence. And from then on, in the present tense or past tense. But there's kind of a line of demarcation of it was future until the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. From that point on, it's present tense. Or only speaking of the immediate past, past tense. Jesus. It's personal. It's purposeful. I will build. And then it's also possessive. Possessive. He said it's my church. You know, we had looked already at this definition of church, Acts 8, 1, Acts 9, 1. Church is the disciples of the Lord. Or if you would, Lords, L-O-R-D-S, apostrophe S. Disciples. The disciples that belong to Jesus. You know, when we speak of Romans 16, 16, churches of Christ, you could grammatically say Christ, C-H-R-I-T. Oh, I spelled that wrong. C-H-R-I-S-T, apostrophe S, churches. Those churches that belong to Jesus. And by the way, there is an implication here that the church belongs to Jesus. My daddy told me one time, he said, son, if you build a church and it belongs to you, you can do as you please. But Jesus built the church and it belongs to him, so you better do as the Lord pleases. You know, there's a lot of good sense in that explanation. And it's very true. It belongs to him. So it's personal, purposeful, and possessive. And for that reason, I should appreciate and love the church. A second thing, let's notice is that we should love and appreciate the church because of what Jesus did for the church. We already read in Ephesians 5.25 that he gave himself for it. Now there's three different words. In fact, there are words that kind of are interesting to notice at this point. One, we would see that he is the ransom. In Matthew 20, verse 28... Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. King James is to be ministered unto, but to minister. And then he concludes, and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus is our ransom. We find in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6 that he is a ransom for all. Now, ransom, we kind of understand this. Um, Ransom, it's a price paid for a person to be released, to be freed, who's captive. We made captive to sin and the devil. And Jesus is that price that's paid so we can be released And be free. It was no small price. It was the price of the cross. It was the price of his blood. There's another word. It's very similar to this. But yet kind of a little different too. It's the word redeemed. The word redeemed. In Ephesians 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Over in 1 Peter, it's interesting there because we have the word redeemed. And he talks about redeemed from your feudal ways, from your forefathers. 
She says, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. One translation says reconciled. Most others say redeemed. But it points out how closely these words are. It's to say, ransom, we understand ransom. A price that's paid so that someone is released, made free, who is captive. But redemption, that's a price paid too. But it's to gain or regain A possession. Okay. To illustrate that, most of you are old enough to remember green stamps. If you're much younger than me, you might not remember them. But I remember going with my mama to the green stamp store. And you know what happened? Go to the grocery store or some other store and you'd get these green stamps and you'd put them in the book and you'd save up these books and you'd go in that store and you could buy things with those, with those green stamp books. And it was called the Redemption Store. And those green stamps, they were the price paid so that you could have whatever it was you could afford with your green stamps. Another illustration. This is current. There's a lot of pawn shops in town, aren't there? Say you're having it tight. And you think, well, if I were to pawn this, I'd have enough money. But you know, for a period of time and for a price, you can redeem that possession. You can buy it back. Well, Jesus, he's that price to buy us, buy us back, and we become his, his possession. So with ransom and redemption, there's a similarity in the sense that a price is paid in each case. One, the emphasis a little bit more on a person released, made free, the other, a little more emphasis on possession to gain or regain. But in each case, a price is paid. And the price paid here is Jesus. And you can't help but understand then the importance of the church, why I ought to love the church, because of its connection, once again, to Jesus. It's his life, his blood. It's that one from eternity that came and lived on this earth, lived a perfect life, lived a life worthy of praise, only to hear a crowd shout, crucify him, crucify him, and to put him on a cross. And there were the suffering and finally the death. And then even, oh, say an insult to injury, after his death, his side is pierced and that blood flows forth. That's the price. Well, there's two R's. Ransom, redemption. And then there's another R, Reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19, you read, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. God through Christ, that is Christ is the cost again to reconcile us to God. Okay, reconcile. That's the idea of make friends again. The whole idea behind this, because of our sin, we became enemies with God. You can read about this in Ephesians chapter 2. But we don't have to stay enemies, and God doesn't want us to stay enemies. He desires that reconciliation. The idea here, God wants us to be friends again, to the extent that. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave... His only begotten Son. You see, here's what not only Jesus said about the church, but here's what Jesus did. He ransomed, He redeemed, and He reconciled. 
And the price of all that was his life and his blood. The church better be important to us, and we better love it. I know someone might say, wait, wait, wait. Okay, preacher, you said the church, or the disciples of the Lord, we're the disciples. Well, that's paramount to saying we're important, and we love us. Yes. No, it does not make us the end. And it's not elevating us to a realm of importance except for this. You see how much God values you. And how much God values you together. As the assembly as the church. It's kind of like, if it means that much to God, I better be careful. If I, if I say something derogatorily, the Lord's church or His people, I better watch out. If I hurt the church as a whole or individually, its people, it was important to Jesus. We see what he said, and we see what he did. And now number three, I think we can say the church, his people, it's important because of what he promises. Now turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And yes, we read this passage this morning. 1 Thessalonians 13. And if you have a Bible that has, you know, Headings, mine says, the coming of the Lord. An interesting thing about 1st and 2nd Thessalonians is in each chapter, there is always some mention of Jesus coming. It may sometimes be very brief and short, or it may be a bit more extensive. And certainly here in chapter 4, a bit more extensive as it's from verses 13 through 18. And it seems to kind of hinge on, maybe the brethren there were thinking, some of our brethren have died. They were dear to us, they were important to us. And I want to tell you this, if you've lived in the Lord's church any length of time, if the Lord's church has been in your life as it ought to be, you've come so close to people that, frankly... They were closer to you than family. And they've gone on. Some of them have died. You cared about them then, you still care about them. You love them then, you love them now. But they've died. Now what, if, if you were to think, if you were to kind of cross your mind that somehow they might miss out on the resurrection, and oh, by the way, what if, okay, I can personally say, I do not know of a person that I've shaken hands with and known and eyeball to eyeball that has died because they were persecuted for the cause of Christ. I want to tell you something. These folks, they probably did. Well, we just read in Acts chapter 9 verse 1, breathing out threatenings and the King James Version word is slaughter, English standard, murders, there were people that lost their lives. So now I think in terms of, here's this brother in Christ. He was so dear to me, and now he's gone. Maybe he's even died for the sake of the gospel. Is he going to in any way miss out on the resurrection? And it seems as if Paul's writing to, you might say, to correct their thinking, make sure they know and understand he says, beginning of verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed 
The word ignorant is in the King James Version. In other words, he wants them to know. He says, about those who are asleep, that is, they've died. That you not grieve as others who do not have hope. He's not saying you will not grieve. But he's saying, you don't have to grieve like those people who have no hope. You've got hope. He said, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So in this resurrection, why? We're not even going to be first. Those ones who have died will be. And he says in verse four, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's writing to the church about the church living and dead. And are you seeing what he's promising? That Jesus is coming again. And there'll be that resurrection of those who have already gone on. In fact, we're living, we don't even precede. He says, for the dead in Christ will rise first. Then he says, then we which are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another or encourage one another with these words. I mentioned today, we oftentimes read this at a funeral, maybe even at the graveside. The point is to give comfort. And that's part of the reason he wrote these words. But in it, he gives a promise to the church. He's coming back. Yes, the Lord's church ought to be important to us. We ought to love it because what Jesus said about the church, what he did for the church, and what he promised to the church. Now sometimes, well, I don't know how long ago it started. seems like sometimes everything started in the 1960s. But I heard the statement, Jesus, yes, the church, no. It does not work that way. When I respond to my Jesus, and I obey Jesus, I take seriously those commands, and I believe, and with all my heart, I turn from my sin, and I confess that faith, and I'm baptized for the remission of sins. I read that the Lord adds me to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, His church, His people. If I want Jesus... And I obey Jesus. He puts me in his church. It's not Jesus, yes, the church, no. Why, in Ephesians 5, we read how Jesus was the head of his body, the church. Are you saying that you want somehow the head, but you don't want the body? That sounds kind of strange. You see, as we honor Jesus and love Jesus... We need also to appreciate, be thankful for, and love his body, the church. If you need to respond tonight, if you are not a member of the Lord's church, I beg of you, obey Jesus. Turn from your sin. Having that faith, we can give you an opportunity to confess that faith and assist you in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. If there's a need for prayer, we'd be glad to take the time and pray for you. you need-